and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah. And today we'll be discussing Debunked by Dito Abbott. Also, I know this is jumping ahead a little bit, but I really appreciate that he says rhymes with Cheeto everywhere his name shows up. Yes, I do too. (laughs) This is the most confident I've ever been introducing a book and author's name. (laughs) (laughs) It makes it easier to have the pronunciation guide. It really does. Anyway, before we get much farther down that rabbit hole, Sarah, what's something great that happened recently? My something great is actually related to what I've been reading lately. And that is that Jennifer Donahue sent over an advance copy of the next Run with the Hunted book, book six in the series of novellas. It's called Burned Asset. And I read it and it was great. And I was delighted that I didn't have to wait until when it comes out sometime in October to read it. Ooh, lucky. Although now I have to wait a year until the next one, and that's less fun. But you were going to have to wait anyway for the next one. It's true. I was. But if I had waited, if I had read it in October, there would have been maybe a slightly shorter wait (laughs) (laughs) because they come out every October or she releases them every October. Well, that's a very good thing. It is. It was fantastic. I looked at my email and saw it at like 930 in the evening. And I was like, I should not start reading this because I should go to bed soon. And I started reading it and I did not go to bed until after I had finished it. (laughs) Oh, isn't that the best? It is. And I mean, to be fair, since their novella is pretty short, it's not like I was staying up all night to read it. But still, it's the principle of the thing. Yeah. I went to Mopop, which is a, a museum up here in Seattle, a, like pop culture museum. We went to see their Hidden Worlds exhibit, which is Leica Studios. They're the stop motion animation studio that did. Oh, yeah. Who did Coraline. Yeah. And some other some other fun ones. Anyway, I'm going to sound like a Grinch because I was not that impressed with Mopop as a whole. <laughs> it didn't give me what I want out of a museum, which is information. Mm. (laughs) It was much more like, here's this really cool prop piece from a horror movie. Here's a spooky quote from that movie. Not like how they make the props or anything like behind the scenes information about the movie. I don't feel like I came out of it knowing anything new about any of these topics. (laughs) Mm, yeah, that makes sense. More experiential than informative. Yeah. I mean, very cool. Like, yeah, lots of really neat stuff to look at. But you didn't really learn anything. No. The Leica exhibit was better because they had, like, interviews playing. They had one area for each of their movies. And then all of the pieces and, like, the deconstructed tiny puppets, which was very cool. And then video interviews for each movie with the the people who worked on it talking about how they made it. So that felt a lot more informative. Comprehensive, yeah. Yeah, they actually told us stuff about how they used 3D printing. Anyway, very neat, very cool. I'm glad I went. Don't think it's a museum I'm going to go to more than once, unless there's another like specific exhibit. But it remains your good thing, despite that. It was very fun. I'm glad I went. (laughs) I know, and then I complained about it, but... (laughs) I don't know. Am I a wet blanket that I want museums to teach me things? Is that so wrong? Maybe you just need to temper your expectations a little. I guess. I don't know. They did have like a full sized xenomorph from Alien. Very cool. Super neat to look at. But then it just was like from the movie Aliens and then the date. And I was like, but that tell me what it's made out of at least. Yeah, that's that's not a lot of information given there. No, their signage could use work. All right. I'm Sounds done. like it. <laughs> it was a good thing, I swear. Uh, what are you drinking today? I made myself a cup of Yenmai tea. Nice. I'm also drinking green tea, although not fancy green tea. I, ha- I do have some nice stuff, but I find that I never drink it because it's too nice. And so I'm never justified in drinking it. No, see, that is a silly reason to not drink nice things. I feel I feel like this with alcohol, too. Don't hoard your good stuff. Like... It's there to be enjoyed. You should drink it. It's true. But it's like, do I want a $5 cup of tea or a 50 cent cup of tea? And sometimes I just want a 50 cent cup of tea. Right. That's valid. Yeah. I always want the $5 cup of tea. But I mean, I always want the $5 cup of tea. But again, then I would run out. Yeah. But like, I mean, you shouldn't 
And I am a little bit guilty of this with things that I can no longer get, like tea from special places. But the whole point of having something is so that you can enjoy it. And you're not enjoying it if it's just sitting on your shelf. I agree with you. I am being silly about this. Then there's no justification for it. You're being very (laughs) silly about this. You should drink your fancy tea. Okay, but can I read you the label on this very cheap bag of tea? Because it's very funny. You could. Fragrant aroma, homely refresher, mellow taste, valuable gift. That's some bad English. It's true. I do like that they call it. On this individual tea bag, it is considered a valuable gift. Not even on the box of 50 tea bags or whatever. Nope. That one tea bag is valuable just by itself. Yep. Valuable gift. So that makes me giggle. And uh, that improves the quality of the tea. A giggle. It's true. I have not read anything extracurricular recently, and you already talked about yours. Yep, I already answered this question. <laughs> you can talk about it again if you want. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can I can talk about Run with the Hunted again because it is a series that I like quite a bit. So you read the one that's coming out in October. Which number in the series is it? So that's number six. Okay. And these books, so it's about these three women who do crime, basically. And each novella is told from the perspective of a different, uh, like, of of one of them. And we actually covered the first book on the podcast. You should go listen to that episode. But this one is from Dolly's perspective. So if there's six books, does that mean there have now been two books from each perspective? Yes. Cool. Yeah. And... I think we've described the series as cozy cyberpunk. And I don't know if that description actually really fits this last one. There's a lot more blood, I think. There's some people getting their fingers broken, like on purpose to make them talk. And it doesn't feel all that like cyberpunky. I mean, the world is still the same world, obviously. So it is cyberpunk. But like, you don't see. That's not the focus of the action, so you don't see a lot of that, except in the robot security dogs. I mean, robot security dogs alone, but we're getting off topic. We are, although before we leave the subject of (laughs) Run with the Hunted, Don, who did have, at one point, she was saying you could donate to her Ko-Fi account and name a robot dog. So I did get Mr. Squeak and Snorri into the book. Wonderful. And Mr. Squeak is a girl. She wears a sparkly bow. (laughs) That's how you know. Yes. Does she also have eyelashes? That's also how you know if an animal is a girl. Eyelashes are not mentioned. I think that the robot security dogs are gender neutral by default. And the people naming them have decided that Mr. Squeak is a girl. Sounds familiar. Yes. Well, I guess you didn't decide that Mr. Squeak was a girl. (laughs) She decided. I did not. She did decide. But it was perfect. It was great. 10 out of 10 stars would name robot security dogs in Run With The Hunted again. All right. There is also a robot dog in Debunked, but we're going to wait to have that conversation until we get to the spoilers. There is. That's a very nice segue. It was pretty perfect. You lined me up very well. (laughs) You're welcome. So uh, we both ran into something very interesting about this book, which is that I've sort of died on the hill of defending footnotes for a while now. (laughs) And then suddenly that didn't work for me. Right. But that's not. So I had the same issue with the physical copy because the footnotes in this book are at the end of each chapter rather than at the bottom of the page. Or all collected at the end of the book. I've run into that before. And then you just have one bookmark at the end for the appendix for all the footnotes. And you just bounce back to it every time. Well. That also works for me. I I don't. <laughs> if they're at the end of the book, I generally don't read them. Really? To be honest, yeah. Because it's too much effort. But you only have to find the section once. And then you keep your bookmark there and you flip back to it. And it's the next one on the list every time. That one is not a hassle to me. I still find that a hassle, so I generally tend not to not to read footnotes like that either. But yeah, the footnotes for this book were all collected at the end of each chapter, which made it really hard to read them. I actually ended up buying the ebook copy because then you could just click on the footnote and it would pop up, and that was a much nicer reading experience. That's very smart. I should have thought of this. <laughs> yes, you should have. Instead, I like, well, for a while, I would try to, when I found a footnote, flip to the end of the chapter to read the footnote. Except there were a couple of times where I didn't realize I flipped too far. And so I was reading footnote number two for the following chapter (laughs) and very confused. 
<laughs> yes, that would be very confusing. I think my way was better. Yeah. And then eventually I just said, okay, whatever. I'll just read the footnotes when I get to the end of the chapter. And then I did not remember the context that they had been brought up in. So sometimes I would try to flip back and find it and usually just ended up not finding it. So struggled with that a little bit. Yeah. I think, you know, if you're listening, if you put out a second edition, I would highly suggest that the footnotes be at the bottom of the page. It might be a little more of a hassle for like formatting the book, but it's worth it for the reader, in my opinion. <laughs> Well, two of the inspirations that Abbott mentions at the end of this are Terry Pratchett and Douglas Adams. And I definitely feel that in the tone, I would say, the sort of whimsical world exploration. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it does have that kind of offbeat humor. And, and just like, not nonsensical fantasy world, but quirky fantasy world. <laughs> fantasy, sci-fi, kind of steampunky. They did all have a uh, not hot air balloons, but all of the air travel was with uh, blimps, basically, which was delightful. Yeah, it's definitely a, a quirky world. I don't know if I would really call it a fantasy world. I know that Debunked didn't get very far in the self-published fantasy competition. I forget what the acronym stands for, the SPSFC, and did much better in the sci-fi one. Okay. And I didn't I didn't necessarily think it was that fantasy, to be honest. Like there is a magical talking sword. Yes, but that's a spoiler. <laughs> the, what I want to say about that is a spoiler. Oh, I, was, I thought it was like just the existence of it. I, was like, I don't think that's no. that enough is a spoiler. But like they say, oh no, it's technology, but it's magic. No. <laughs> yeah, but you you don't get to it until the end of the book like the last third of the book. And so for two thirds, it's really, really heavily science-y. Ah, uh, okay. Well, you know I'm weird about science fiction and just claiming like, no, no, there's a science explanation for all this magic. Don't worry about it. Does not fly with me. No, so I don't think it's, I mean, this is not hard science fiction at all. I think steampunk is a good description of it. And I don't count steampunk as fantasy inherently. Neither do I think it counts as sci-fi. It's genre. It's weird genre. I think it's more sci-fi than fantasy, depending on other elements. The genre of the book is young adult adventure something something. Yes, this is the genre of the world is fantasy. The setting is a fantasy setting, even if you don't find out until later. I didn't find it particularly fantasy. I mean, fantasy elements, but not... Would it be portal then? Portal fantasy is a thing, right? Because they get portals to this other universe, at like right at the beginning? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's all of that to say, it's very hard to categorize genre, world genre for this book, I think. It blurs lines. Sure. We're not going to agree on this statement, so... <laughs> It is as much science fiction as it is fantasy. I'm okay with saying it's neither, but I don't think it's one more than the other. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but it is It is very definitely a young adult action adventure. We agree there. Right. The, the plot itself definitely is 100% that. Yeah. So the plot of this book is we have Alex and Ozzy who are somewhere in the like the 13, 14-ish age range, I think. I didn't actually get a good handle on how old they are but i think they're in that area yeah there's no mention of school which is the easiest way to sort of measure that <laughs> yeah and i think they've been with their grandfather for like the last seven years or so because their parents are gone their parents are dead and their grandfather's this famous explorer and he is off and off exploring and they get this letter from him saying that he's dead. They're initially not too worried because they get a lot of these letters because he gets in a lot of scrapes quite frequently. But when he doesn't show up and he doesn't show up, they finally, you know, realize, I guess he is gone. And then they get kidnapped by dinosaur people and dragged into this new world and have lots of adventures and realize that maybe their grandfather is not so much dead as he is disappeared. Yeah, a lot of like precocious orphan hijinks. It reminded me a lot of the series of unfortunate events, not in what actually happens, <laughs> but the, the vibe of these sort of early teen kids being far more competent than any 14-year-old in the history of the world has ever been, getting in and out of scrapes. 
Yeah, I've never actually read a series of unfortunate events or watched the show. I was a little too old when it first came out to really be interested. But what this reminded me of kind of was Spy Kids. And I don't have a good explanation for that because it's probably been like 20 years since I've watched the movie. But the feeling that I remember having watching Spy Kids is what this book gave me, if that makes sense. I agree with you 100%. I didn't make that connection, but as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, yeah. And it also, I mean, it kind of compares because like Spy Kids is about these children trying to go rescue their parents, right? Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Also finding out that their parents are, I'm going to say, have magical superpowers. Again, that's not technically what it is in Spy Kids. But if you translate what happens in that movie to the (laughs) real world, those are magical superpowers, not anything realistic for anyone to actually be able to do. Yes. So, yeah, finding out about the secret lives of your guardians and then having to use specialized skills to save them. I could tell I was too old for this book when at the very, very beginning, where the reader gets described the lighthouse that Ozzy and Alex have grown up in, and it's booby-trapped everywhere. And so it, it's describing how Ozzy knows, you know, which steps to step on and, and how to avoid all the booby traps. And at the final moment, he leaps over a sand pit. And I was like, okay, I'm down with the whimsical booby trapped house. We can like pretend that that's a thing. But a sand pit in a <laughs> living room? <laughs> how did they, what are the logistics of installing a sand pit in a living room? I have so many questions. And I was like, ah, fuck, I'm an adult, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. There was a lot I really liked about this book. I do think that I was a little too old for it, but this is the kind of book that I would have absolutely adored had I been reading it at like that 11 or 12 age range. Yeah. And I mean, as Abbott mentions at the end of the book, he wrote the kind of book that he would have loved as a 13 year old. So I think he did an excellent job at nailing that vibe. Absolutely. Especially when you're in that age where you start like wanting to read longer, more complex books. This book's like 400 pages long. It's huge. Mm -hmm. It absolutely would have made me feel so proud when I was 11. Like, yeah, look at this huge book I'm reading. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, it's very funny. There's nonstop action. It's a lot of fun, but I think I would have enjoyed it more as a younger reader than I did as a 33-year-old. It definitely, I think, is designed for the optimum experience for someone in that age range. There are some details like the text explicitly telling you how to pronounce Angelus, the name of the ship they drive around on, or explaining to the reader that Noctum is Latin for night. Things that I think even a slightly older reader would either look up or have already figured out from reading a million years of fantasy books. Not the pronunciation so much as Noctum being Latin for night. Yeah. But if you're like 10, you wouldn't think of that. You wouldn't think to Google it, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And then also there's so much information packed in this book about the world. Like we have the footnotes and everything that Alex and Ozzy go through and experience and the places they travel to. And as an adult, I was like, I'm tired. This is too much. I need a I need a break. But as a kid, you have that boundless energy to to handle that constant influx of information. I think that's what makes it feel like Douglas Adams to me. Just like the constantly introducing new stuff and never like stopping to interact with a concept that's been introduced. I think for the first 80% of the book, every single page is an escalation from the previous page. Like There's no moment of rest at all. Yeah. I would agree with that. Which is very high energy and a very exciting adventure. But my favorite part is the island of amnesia. And we'll get to that in a minute. (laughs) (laughs) We will. We will talk about amnesia in the spoiler section. Well, I think any 10 to 13 year old who's been getting into reading would love this book. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to think if there's because I'm inclined to actually say more like 10 a 10 year old who wants to push their like reading, right? Yeah. Who wants to try maybe a, a longer, more challenging book? I think it depends on on reading levels. I'm just trying to think if there were any topics in this that felt too much for a 10 year old. And I don't think so. I think so. I mean, it's pretty like there is some violence in it, but not in a disturbing way. Yeah. Like it's it's all kind of I don't want to say sanitized, because I think that does the book a disservice. But it's like fantasy violence, 
where you don't see the gore. Yeah. It's not super intense. Yeah. The violence part. The adventure part <laughs> yes. intense, but that's yes. delightful. So I think if there was a younger reader who wanted to like push themselves, this would also be great for them. Yeah, I think a younger reader, like a precocious reader, could enjoy it. And there's nothing that as an adult giving this book to a kid, you would really worry about. Yeah. But yeah, fun, super fun book. And uh, can we talk about amnesia? <laughs> Yes, we can <laughs> we can talk about amnesia. The remainder of this episode contains spoilers. Okay, so I know we said we'd talk about amnesia and we will. But first, the the conceit of this book, the plot of this book is that the grandfather is off looking for these three magic stones. Tell me they're not magic. No, we don't have to reopen that conversation. That he thinks will save the universe, but this other group thinks will destroy the universe. And I'm very unclear on what's going on there. Well, we don't get a ton of information about the stones themselves in this book. This is the first book in a series. I don't know how many the series, like how many books are eventually going to be in the series, but I don't think we yeah like i feel like that's something that we're going to learn as the series progresses all we really know is that ozzy's grandfather or ozzy and alex's grandfather is looking for the stones uh, and he's one of the like preeminent stone hunters and knocked him think that's a very bad idea and so they are trying to stop him yeah that yep and that's really all you need to follow the, the plot but yeah <laughs> I, there was some other stuff coming up with the, were they stone? I don't think stone lords was actually the right phrase. Is that what they were called? No, I don't think so. These ancient people who made these artifacts, because we also get a couple of other magic items, I said it, that are gifted to Alex and Ozzy. One is a bracelet that makes a shield, and one is a hilt that turns into a glove that turns into a magic talking sword. Yes. And we don't learn a lot about I was really confused when Ozzy starts hearing voices in his head and it took me a minute to comprehend and put put two and two together that that was the sword that was talking to him. Really? I didn't struggle with that. I guess a magic talking sword is such a, <laughs> a trope that I was like, oh, of course it's the sword. What else could it possibly be? <laughs> possibly it's because I was reading late at night and I was tired and overwhelmed with information in this book already. No, what I was confused about was how these magic items are connected with the magic stones. And like, were these artifacts also part of ending the war? I, I think probably uh, now that the grandfather has been brought into the fold as of the end of this book, maybe he'll be able to explain it more. Yeah, I think we're we're going to get more information in books two and onwards. I'm considering this book was all about finding the guy who knew what was going on. It makes yeah. sense that we don't. <laughs> yeah, like I think I think there's a lot of setup in this book. Like there's a lot of this book that stands on its own too, but there's a lot of setup that's being prepared for the rest of the series. We meet a couple of different factions, the names for which I don't remember at all. They're the like the Saucians, it's that's not it. The lizard people, the dinosaur people who were mostly bad guys, except for Layla, who was great. She was a, she's part of our core team, and she's like an outcast dinosaur. Yeah, I liked Layla a lot. She was wonderful. Um, very much like the gruff mechanic slash the heavy. Um, mm -hmm. But also clearly like actually cares about Ozzy and Alex, and I liked her. Yeah, like she tries to give them self-defense lessons and just kind, kind of looks out for them. Yeah. We also have this like, civilization of mad scientists whom one of our other core team members pascal used to work with or be a part of but he went independent layla used to be part of them too that's true but she was a mechanic there she was not one of the mad scientists no but the society is made up of the mechanics and the mad scientists like she participated in the civilization <laughs> okay sure sure <laughs> yes and there was also the archive which is a like fortress of librarians but they're like in a volcano in a volcano but they're like badass fighty librarians they get really mad if you harm the books or you know 
are overdue. Or if you have a book that they think they should own instead and that they will kill you. Like the way you described it is correct, <laughs> but makes them sound a little bit too charming. Well, okay. I think I think that part of the so the the archive has been infiltrated by Noctem, these people who are trying to keep stone hunters from finding the stones. And I think part of the if you have a book that they want, they'll kill you is Noctem going after their grandfather's journal which contains all of his information about finding the stones looking for the stones maybe but that was not a whoa they're really into this book that was a oh yeah of course they're gonna do that <laughs> you know <True. laughs> in the, like in the book this book treated those actions as very normal for them <laughs> true i mean the best part about the uh mad scientist civilization is drog i liked drog Drog being the robot dog that we teased at the beginning of <laughs> of our discussion of this book. <laughs> uh, apparently Pascal invented him and then let him loose on the town before he left. So Drog has just been creating mayhem for years. <laughs> and I love that. I really liked how all of the scientists were so terrified of Drog. And they have like a Drog watch. And they had someone who was... On the radio giving, like, drog alerts. And not because he's dangerous, but because he messes up their experiments. <laughs> like, he steals parts and things. Yeah, they seem to think that he had, like, laser eyes and stuff. He doesn't. But, I mean, the scientists are not necessarily the most down-to-earth people. And Alex did have a comment at one point that if Pascal heard that fear of theirs, then he would add a laser component to drog. I did get the impression that Drog could harm, but it's not that he's been on a murder rampage. No, he hasn't he hasn't been going around on a killing spree. It's true. I believe he mostly uses his assets in self-defense. Yeah. And also to steal important experiment components, which is yeah. why everyone's mad at him. But but to my point, like clearly the scientists are afraid of him beyond just that like oh okay i think that's them maybe blowing things out of proportion and imagining stuff like we've said drug doesn't have laser eyes and they seem to there's a rumor going around that he does or whatever but yeah i took that as them what's the word oh no hyperbolizing blowing him out of proportion to justify how terrified they are of him like, Possible. you know, the classic, the guy who jumped me was 12 feet tall, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's possible. But I I mean, they are doing it. Well, yeah, because he's messing up their experiments. And Alex does say that if Pascal heard it, <laughs> he would he would give Drog laser eyes or whatever, laser capabilities. Right, right, right. I believe he has these capabilities. I don't who knows. I don't think he I don't think he has them. Not I, not laser eyes specifically, but he probably has something. Yeah. But I don't think he's been using them on scientists. I think the scientists are no, just saying I, he's this dangerous to justify how scared they are of him. I, I don't think that he's actually been harming, physically harming the scientists. Anyway, we are drog apologists. I accept this. I mean, drog is the best. Mm -hmm. I love drog. Someone else that I really loved, who doesn't get a ton of page time after the beginning of the book, was Mrs. Willoughby. She's the housekeeper for Alex and Ozzy and is basically their guardian because their grandfather is off, you know, doing all of this exploration. And initially she's just kind of like this strict lady who takes care of them. But at the funeral scene, we see her like kick ass and be some kind of super ninja. And I had so many questions. And so do the kids. <laughs> <laughs> and so do the kids. Yes. I'm not alone in my questions. It's definitely implied at the end that we're going to, if not see more of her, learn more about her later on. Yeah, I mean, I I don't for a second think that she's never coming back and that we're just going to keep having questions. But I do want to know, like, how does she know so much about the world through the portal, Teravinum? Like, does she know that much? She, she just knew about she knew about Noctum. No, nah, that's true. That's true. Like, so how does she know about Noctum? Like, where did she learn all of her fighting skills? Like, why is she the housekeeper for 
this explorer. Like, I just, I have questions. I did love this, the switch, the reveal of her being super badass. Yeah, it was great. I'm not particularly charmed by the severe governess. That's not a, a character that I'm, I like because they're mean. <laughs> and it's not funny that they're mean just because they're old women. I didn't get the sense that she was exactly the severe governess, though. I mean, telling them to wear appropriate clothes to a funeral is not... Not unreasonable. Fair. That's not unreasonable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I think moving booby traps, like placing new booby traps over the house, around the house every week, that's a little offbeat, but... I, yeah, I we don't we don't get enough of her to make me think that she was falling into the severe governess archetype. I guess it just rubbed me the wrong way that Ozzy wasn't allowed to openly care about his grandfather. He had to hide the newspaper clippings and stuff. Mm. My impression of that was more that he was hiding not his caring about his grandfather, but like how much he was trying to find their parents like figure out what happened to them because mrs willoughby who knows way more than we know at that point didn't want them to be put in danger by looking for them well i have just realized that that's kind of fucked up too huh since ozzy remembered seeing his parents it get is. kidnapped by dinosaurs and gets put in therapy and told he's crazy for seven years while mrs willoughby knew all along that that was real that is a little fucked up yeah hold on i just made that yeah. connection <laughs> that, I is, don't, that is a little fucked up <laughs> i don't think we can I, I would rather believe that she does not know that much about this other world because the other way is kind of horrifying well the the implication there too is that their grandfather knew and he's yeah. not told them yeah, but he's also not around. I don't believe he was the he's, one who put Ozzy in therapy. He's been around enough to, like, say, Ozzy, why are you in therapy? You should not be in therapy because you saw something that actually occurred. Like, yeah. he's around and he's around enough to yeah. comment on that. Yeah. Rough. So I, I do think that the adults in Ozzy's life have let him down a little bit. Well, Yes. <laughs> And that's part of the, uh, like, precocious independent children thing, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I, Alex and Ozzy are far too badass for a 14 year old, which is so much fun as a kid to read because you're like, yeah, kids can be independent <laughs> like adults. <laughs> yeah, like, like, I, I feel like that's part of the specific genre of book, which is from from an adult perspective, pretty fucked up. <laughs> and then, yeah, also with the idea that no one believed him, but he was actually right all along. That would be very satisfying to read as a kid. Mm -hmm. There are definitely a couple of things in this book that I can like identify as wish fulfillment for a young person that I like just doesn't doesn't work for you as an adult. Yeah, doesn't get me in my heart. Yeah. The other thing that I couldn't get into as much, and now maybe this is because I'm an only child as well as being a grown ass adult. <laughs> But the, like, sibling dynamic between Alex and Ozzy, the not competition, I appreciated that. They love each other and have each other's backs. But there is still this, like, narrative of Ozzy always comparing himself to his sister and how much better she is than him. I So I disagree a little bit with your interpretation of that. So the way that the siblings are described, Alex is, like, the athletic one and Ozzy's the intellectual one. Ozzy is the one who knows how to like escape traps and do all of that stuff. And, and Alex has all the physical capabilities. Like she's a great runner, athletic, et cetera, et cetera. And all of the times that we see Ozzy comparing himself to Alex are when he's in situations that require a lot of athleticism. And he's saying, man, Alex would be better in this because like, athletics is what she's into yeah but that still happens a lot it does it does happen a lot but and i don't like i'm not disagreeing with you for like not being interested in that but i think it's a little different from ozzy comparing himself unfavorably to alex in 
situations that where it's completely irrelevant. <laughs> so you're saying it's okay because he's right? <laughs> <laughs> she would be better than him? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes but also like I, I get your frustration because it does happen a lot and that that just does feel like something a, a kid everyone sees themselves as the underdog right especially mm -hmm. when you're younger and so that really just felt like playing into that mindset yeah but also I mean okay I don't know if this is actually true but it's probably like the the kind of reader who is reading this book as a child is probably not as athletically inclined as Alex is probably much more on the Aussie level. And so, well, Alex freely climbs up giant pillars of rocks with no harness. I think it's fair to say most 14 year olds are not as athletic as her. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> but we we get a lot more and we do have like points in the book that are from Alex's point of view. And to be fair, she's saying, man, Ozzy would be so much better in this situation than I am. That went a long way for me, but she only says it once, whereas Ozzy says it like 10 times. Yeah, it definitely happens more for Ozzy. But I think that a lot of readers would sympathize with Ozzy's statement, like someone more athletic would be better in this situation. I mean, yeah, because he's in an adventure. It, it's that like nerd versus jock thing. Woe is me, I'm a nerd. I, th I think what I'm trying to say is that it's relatable to the reader. I think it would be if you were 10. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what I'm saying is, as not being 10. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I didn't know if that was the being tired of the jock versus nerd thing or not really understanding comparing yourself to a sibling. Maybe it's a little bit of both. It's maybe a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. And also maybe a little of not being 10. And yeah, a little bit of that. <laughs> Okay, Drog was great, but my favorite part of the book was Amnesia. Amnesia was really fun. We don't really spend a ton of time there, comparatively speaking. Well, we don't spend a lot of time anywhere because you're always moving on to the next place. Yeah, that's true. I love it. It sets up this mystery. How come everyone who goes to the island of Amnesia loses their memory and doesn't come back? Explores that and explains it in a really fun way. We end up getting a twist that it's a conspiracy. And I don't know, just everything about that was really well done. And I love the pacing of it, of Ozzy, like, discovering this strange place and slowly, like, learning about it, both as a natural phenomenon and then also how this memory pollen is being used by the Noctum to stop people from finding out about the magic stones. And then it's also Ozzy's, like, big adventure and his time to shine. Yeah, that was great. Mm -hmm. I like I didn't gravitate to it quite as much as I think you did, but I did I did I did have fun with it for sure. Conspiracies are fun. I <laughs> loved that first we get the explanation of oh these big headbutting beetles headbutt everyone and that's how they lose their memory. The grainers from migraine. Yes. And then it turns out that that was a cover-up and it's actually this orchid pollen that is naturally occurring on the island, but the head guy there who uses an oxygen respirator so he doesn't breathe in the pollen, but because he tells everyone that it's actually the headbutting beetles, they don't realize that that's what's happening. He's dosing people with it because it, you end up getting a resistance over time. But to prevent that from happening, he's like experimenting with super concentrated versions of it. Yeah, he was pretty bad. He was awful. Actually, he was terrible. And watching him get taken down was great. Discovering his like secret lair with all of his information on the people who've been living there all of their like true identities i love me a conspiracy yeah that was i i agree it was it was fun it was a yeah. fun little mini episode also there was a sea serpent i wish we got more of the sea serpent yeah i liked the sea serpent she did spit lightning it was great mm -hmm. she was she was a pretty badass sea serpent any kind of ocean monster i'm a sucker for <laughs> yeah all of the different like weird plants and animals on the island that we we get to hear a little bit about is fun. Everything about amnesia was fun. That's where we first learn that Ozzy and Alex's father, at least, might not be as dead as we thought. Yeah. And I think that's amnesia. The, the storyline that happens while Ozzy is on that island is one of the first times where we start getting callbacks to things. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're finally getting payoff of stuff that's been planted. Mm-hmm. 
And that is very satisfying to me. Even if it's just like stuff on the island, you know, these migraine beetles are introduced and then they come back in the next chapter as an explanation and then they come back again as how Ozzy defeats the the leader. So we're getting like some really nice follow through Mm -hmm. with amnesia in a way that I don't think we see as much in other parts of the book. Yeah, I think this is also where the kid, Alex is not here. She's still in the the scientist island. But I think this is really where the children start coming into their own in the sense that they are finally kind of the ones who solve problems instead of creating them. Like they still create some problems, but. I was going to say Alex actually has a really short end of the stick. Yeah. (laughs) But these are the two independent adventures. Yeah. And and they do get to be kind of instrumental in solving the the adventure in a in a way that they're not in earlier bits of the book. Yeah. I definitely like the amnesia science island portion was my favorite. And then like the way it bounces back and forth between them, I think was well handled with pacing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We're on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Blue Sky, lots of places, at Fiction Fans Pod. You can also email us at fictionfanspod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and follow us wherever your podcasts live. We also have a Patreon where you can support us and find our show notes and some other nonsense. Thanks again for listening, and may your villains always be defeated. Bye. Bye.